Rev it up and welcome to Cars Yeah, show number 1,426. Keep your history, even if you don't think it's important or you're rolling your eyes, you've got to save all your documents. Maybe your granddaughter will want to write a book about you. This is Cars Yeah, where you'll enjoy interviews with inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Mark Green is here to provide you with a fuel injection of automotive inspiration. So get in, sit down, buckle up, and get ready for a wild ride here on Cars Yeah. What's the worst thing for your car's interior? No, it's not that milkshake the kids spilled in the back seat. It's the sun. Harmful UV rays cook your automobile's interior hour after hour when it's parked outside, even on a cloudy day. What's the solution? Covercraft sunscreens. They protect your dash, seats, and interior finishes from those damaging UV rays while keeping the interior temperature tolerable, even on the hottest summer days. No more painfully sizzling seats and steering wheels for you. They unfold quickly and easily install, stay where you put them, and are custom pattern for an exact fit. The foam core acts as a cooling insulator, and you can get yours in different colors and finishes. And they even fold up easily and store under your seat or on the floor. I've used Covercraft sunscreens for years, and they are a fast and easy solution that protect my beloved cars when they're not in the garage. Learn more and order yours at Covercraft.com. Want to protect your entire vehicle? Get a car cover from Covercraft. They have those too. That's Covercraft.com. And tell them Mark sent you. My favorite collector car magazine is Keith Martin's Sports Car Market. I've been a subscriber for decades. Sports Car Market is the Wall Street Journal for the enthusiast and the collector. It's your monthly must-read whether you dream of owning a collector car, have two cars, or 200. Sports Car Market has been around for 31 years, and it's filled with valuable articles, intelligent write-ups, and the latest auction sales. Go to sportscarmarket.com and subscribe today. Plus, you'll get the exclusive SEM guide to restoration shops included for free. At checkout, use the code CARSYA and receive a 50% discount on your digital subscription. It's an exclusive offer from me here at Cars Yeah. I'm Mark Green, and I love Sports Car Market Magazine. Hello, automotive enthusiasts. I'm revved up and so excited to introduce today's very special guest calling in from a very beautiful part of the country, very near Yosemite National Park, Ruth Fruhoff. Ruth, are you buckled up and ready for a fun ride? I am. All right. Got your trailer ready to go and you listeners will understand that in just a minute. Ruth Fruhoff is the founder of the Fruhoff Trailer Historical Society, an organization dedicated to the preservation of the history of the Fruhoff Trailer Company and the Fruhoff Family Legacy. She had a successful career in the business of fine art commerce and is the youngest daughter of Roy and Ruth Fruhoff. The family history became her passion after looking through some of his, her father's business papers and learning more about her father, who she lost when she was very young at the age of eight, has led her on a book project about the company, her grandfather, her father, and the website singingwheels.com tells a lot more about this rich history of the Fruoff Trailer Company. And I'll tell you listeners, you know, as a little kid growing up, we did a lot of road trips. We travel in the family station wagon, the Vista Cruiser. And back then, I thought every truck was a Fruoff truck because that's all you ever saw on the roads were those trailers and those mud flaps that had the name, the family name Fruoff. So what a legacy. Ruth, I've told our listeners just a little bit about you. Before I jump into the questions, could you take just a brief moment and share a little bit more about your life, your career, and your passion for understanding your family legacy and history? Thank you, Mark. I appreciate it. It's wonderful to be with you and your audience. Um, for years after my father died when I was young, my very my father's very German secretary packed up his office and all of these boxes lived in our attic for years. And every now and then, I don't think my mother at the time could deal with it. She was pretty blown away by his sudden death. So we as kids would kind of creep up there and open up boxes. And you never knew what you would find, a, you know, a thank you note from pre a president or, you know, a court transcript or you know, it was always these things that fascinated, you know, an adolescent. 
so when my mother died in 1997, my brothers wanted to throw all these boxes away that had just been collecting dust for nigh on 30, 40 years. And I refused. And I took all of these boxes, about 30 boxes, much to the chagrin of my <laughs> of my husband at the time. And we uh, carted them all across the country where I, they continued to gather dust in my home. And, um, and I still would open the boxes and wade through, you know, with mystery and trepidation, not really knowing what you, you were going to discover. Um, and back in about uh, the last economic downturn in about 2011, 2012, um, I was laid off of my job in the tech industry. I work in the contemporary art world. I had all this time on my hands. So I thought, okay, I'm going to investigate this, these boxes, see if anyone cares about this subject matter. And I kind of had talked myself out of it, you know, oh, no one cares. The company went bankrupt in 97. It's an old company. So I thought, well, let me build a website to see, kind of test the waters. So I built the website. And oh, my God, you can't imagine it just totally opened up a Pandora's box. And I mean that in a positive way. I was getting contacted by former employees, journalists. Um, the uh, German Institute in Washington, D.C. reached out to me and they wanted to include my grandfather as part of their immigrant project, which where they were chronicling 100 German Americans who helped to create the country, basically. John Kluge, you know, Anheuser-Busch and my granddad. So all of these things were just happening in sudden domino effect. And I realized that the name brand was still very much alive and well. Yeah, it, you know, this is fascinating. That's why I was so excited to have you on the show, because, again, it's it's been a part of, and you listeners will learn here, the incredible things that this family created that made things happen in this country from a business standpoint so that commerce and goods can move around the country so much easier. It's so fascinating. As we continue on this journey, though, I want to start by asking you for some kind of success quote, a mantra, some kind of thought or saying that has meaning for you. It's a nice way to get the trailer wheels turning here on cars. Yeah. So, Ruth, grab the wheel. <laughs> well, I don't really have any kind of inspirational quote. I think my drive really was to discover more information about my father who was taken away from me when I was uh, really a young girl. And I grew up always meeting people who knew him, who would just go on and on telling me stories about him. And, and they were passionate about who he was. And it made me yearn to know more about my father. So I think every time I, you know, in the early stages when I had the courage to dive into those boxes, you know, you never really, as I said, you never knew what you would discover. I learned more and more about my father. And the more I learned, the more I confirmed all of the the legacy that I had been told by all of the millions of people who knew him that I that I encountered, you know, who knew where. So I think that has really been the, my number one driving force. Uh, then I think my German DNA got involved and I, I really developed a love and passion for engineering. I just think it is fascinating. You know, I love nothing more than crawling around junkyards and crawling underneath trailers to see if they're fruhoffs and um, get a lot of a big kick out of it. You know, this is really cool. And I'm going to put a link to a short video that uh, Ruth sent me. I love your name too, Ruth, because that was my grandmother's name. Oh. So uh, every time I say your name, I kind of think about her. She I grew up and lived on a farm in Texas and was married to my grandfather for 72 years. And so every time I say your name, I get a little warm spot in my heart here. Um, she's been gone for quite a long time. But uh, at any rate, uh, it's a good segue to the next question. I usually ask my guests about a story that instigated their passion for cars. In your respect, I'm going to ask you to share a lot more about the family. August, Otto, Fruhoff trailers. Um, you talked about opening these boxes and discovering the past that you didn't know about your father, your grandfather in the industry. So 
Tell us a lot more about it. And a little later in the show, where I'm going to talk about or have Ruth talk about some of the incredible innovations that I had no idea were all Fruhoff innovations that we take for granted today of how commerce gets moved around the country. But let's go way back and start about how this company was built from the beginning. Kind of take me through some of that legacy, some of that time frame. Sure, Mark. I'm happy to. Well, as I said, uh, I was contacted by the German Institute in Washington, and had, they had asked me for a, you know, a short essay on my granddad, and that was such an honor to be included in that. And so it forced me to really dive into the history of my granddad, which was also the early history of the Fruhoff Trailer Company. And I, that was just a total fascinating journey for me. Reached out to the U.S. Patent Office, reached out to family members of Otto Newman, who at the time was my grandfather's business partner. These guys were, were blacksmiths. And, you know, for them, the advent of the automotive age was bad news. <laughs> you know, so if you, you have a, shop that can handle 40 horses a day and you're replacing horseshoes and all of a sudden Henry Ford comes along with the Model T. Put you you out of business. (laughs) Exactly. You're starting to realize the handwriting on the wall. However, at the time, uh, passenger cars were not thought of for commercial purposes, which I found really interesting. They weren't going out of business quite yet. Still goods were being moved by horse and wagon. And one day, one of their customers, a lumber merchant in Detroit, and as you can imagine in those days, we're talking 1913, 1914, uh, lumber merchants were really the wealthy class. And he had a passenger boat that he wanted to haul to his vacation home in northern Michigan. We have a lot of lakes in Michigan where I was born and raised. Bringing it there with a horse and wagon would take, you know, three, four, five days over unpaved roads, by the way. But using his brand new Model T, he might accomplish that uh, journey in maybe a, a day. So he asked my grandfather and his partner, Otto Newman, if they could rig up some way to attach the boat on a wagon to the back of the Model T. So my grandfather accepted the challenge, and they right away started figuring out how to do that safely. Of course, in those days, if you had a bumper pull, you know, there was the danger of of jackknifing, and, you know, there wasn't really an effective bumper pull hitch. You know, those guys couldn't go to the hardware store. They wanted something. They had to actually build it. They got the idea of creating the very first fifth wheel hitch. So what they did, and this is so brilliant, they removed the back seat from the Model T and removed the front axle from the wagon and sandwiched them together with a primitive pin hitch. So this was a novelty. Not only did it prevent the the trailer from jackknifing, it was safer, uh, and it absolutely accomplished the goal that the lumber merchant wanted, which was to get his boat to his vacation home. Since the Model T had been uh, adapted by my grandfather, the owner of the Model T went to Henry Ford and asked his permission to let him adapt several Model Ts for commercial purposes for use in his lumber yard. And Henry Ford denied him that and immediately canceled the warranty on any Model Ts that were adapted for these purposes. Now, this guy didn't care at all. And he went right ahead and asked my grandfather to set up a number of other early semi-trailers. So these trailers were basically adapted wagons with just a single axle. And he immediately started using what they called the shuttle system. So you'd have maybe a single truck and two or three trailers. And you would have one your truck out with one trailer doing a delivery. The other trailer would be at your yard being loaded, or maybe another one would be was being unloaded. So you you're constantly in use with your truck. You never had any downtime. So this was a, a novelty and a way that they could compete against traditional trucks 
or traditional four-wheel trailers. And they came up with this really clever advertising uh, slogan called, a horse is like a truck, it can pull more than it can carry. Great, great slogan, by the way. I I love it. Yeah. Makes sense. You think about a person, you can even pull something a lot more weight than you can carry. So there you go. Yeah, that's right. That's exactly right. And so with a couple of, you know, interesting competitive details, they were really able to go head to head competing with pickup trucks or, you know, because they could carry, I mean, those things were like tanks. They could carry some upwards of eight tons, you know, in 1918, that was a lot of weight. And in fact, they were almost ahead of the trucks because the trailers had the capacity to carry more ton than the trucks were available to haul it. So the truck industry had to really, in many ways, play catch up, which I always find fascinating. Yeah, you know, it's just, it's really, really cool because taking back in time, again, for things that we take for granted today that we see all the time, that this stuff didn't exist at all. And you kind of wonder why Henry Ford did go, oh, he, I see. and well, he eventually did, trucks. I, well, yeah. I can make more than cars. I should make trucks and wagons and maybe trailers. But thankfully, uh, your family there, and I love the story in the video where, uh, was it Otto that was walking by listening to <laughs> your grandfather cursing and he couldn't get the shoes on this ornery horse? And uh, he said, I can shoe that horse. And he said, if you can, you could come and work for me. And that's how they got together. Is that story true? That story is true. Wow. Keep in mind that they were all speaking German. Of course. So Otto was coming to uh, see my granddad, who was legendarily kind of cantankerous and didn't suffer fools gladly. So I'm sure Otto was maybe a little nervous. And, you know, there was big competition for jobs in those days. And over the fence, Otto heard cursing in German, right? And he re- responded back also in German, not knowing who it was. And my grandfather, uh, according to lore, you know, got mad and threw his tools down and said, if you can do it better than me, have at it. And bingo, Otto shooed the horse and got a job. <laughs> there you go. I love that story. Well, I always ask my guests about a, a big challenge or a big failure in their life. Uh, maybe a, an appropriate question in this quest that we're on today is, is pulling all the information out of these old boxes and trying to make a story out of all this. Because what most of us are probably taking for granted is you didn't get to spend those years in your lives around your parents, your father, like most of us did because you were so young. So you weren't in all that. So when you were putting all this together, what what were some of the biggest challenges you faced of trying to dissect the life of your father and then put it out there for people so they could understand it? Well, keep in mind that for me, I was dealing, the whole idea was for me connected to the death of my dad. So every time I went to gingerly open up those boxes, I was revisiting the pain of that loss. And also, the loss of control of the company. So it was like a double loss because when my dad died, all of our family was no longer involved with the Fruhoff trailer company. So it was um, really shaking hands with loss, shaking hands with failure and uh, diving into it. My persistence uh, paid off because the more and more I learned about my father, the more gratifying and rewarding that was. But I still was focusing on, you know, the the what we at the time perceived was the death of the company and also, as I said, the death of my father. So what I also discovered was that the international branches at the time of the U.S. bankruptcy in 1997, uh, Fruhoff was the 75th largest company in the world. You know, it takes a trick to destroy a company like that. (laughs) And the guy who was responsible was a lawyer. No offense to lawyers, but need I say more? And um, so the international divisions during the U.S. bankruptcy were sold off and they all became independent. So what we discovered was that there was Fruhoff trailers being manufactured in the old way, just like they always had been, using all the technology and the the intellig- the uh, intellectual property, and they're continuing in business in France, UK, South Africa, Japan, Mexico, Turkey. Uh, and there's one. Oh, New Zealand is another big one. 
So I reached out to all these companies and so and I've been in touch with them. And over the course of of the past three or four or five years, uh, what's happening now is Fruhoff of Mexico owns the U.S. trademark. They're bringing Fruhoff trailers back into the U.S. market. They're working with a distributor in in St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, they purchased property and they're planning on setting up a, a manufacturing plant in the U.S. That for me it blows my mind every time I think about it. Nippon Fruhoff in Japan it has also really expanded into Thailand, the Philippines, China. They're a really huge company. And they've asked me to consult with them and help create a global connection between all the different Fruhoff trailer plant companies and um, with the idea that together they'll be stronger. So that's happening right now. So what we originally thought was, you know, this exploration into this failure and the destruction of a great U.S. brand name, you know, has become something completely different. And I get chills and uh, goosebumps when I think about how exciting that is. Yeah, it's fascinating. Well, let's talk a little bit about some of the incredible inventions and innovativeness of the Fruhoff Trailer Company, uh, of your family, because... In doing a little investigation before we got together today, I mean, I found it really fascinating that there are so many things that today, again, we take for granted that we go, so what? That just is the way a truck connects to the back of a, a tractor or a trailer connects to a tractor or vice versa. Um, so talk about a couple of these things that were so innovative that uh, that your dad and your grandfather and your family came up with. Sure, I'm happy to. Uh, there's a couple cute stories uh, connected to some of the history. So remember, I was telling you about the primitive pin hitch uh, that they first used for those very early semi-trailers. Well, of course, that wasn't the most effective hitch system, but particularly on many unpaved roads at that time and going up and down over hill and dale. So they started in about 1914. It must have been late 1914 because they patented this first semi-trailer in 1914. But they started using the Martin Rocking fifth wheel hitch. This was a fifth wheel hitch company in Massachusetts. And uh, Charles Martin was a, something of a scoundrel. We discovered m many lawsuits against Charles Martin. And you can imagine that doing business with this guy must have made my very German grand grandfather swear probably in several languages. But the Martin Rocking Hitch had the advantage that it rocked. It was kind of a round wagon wheel uh, on a kind of a hinge that would rock. So going over hills, it, it would be very effective. So they right away got their engineers. That first uh, outside employee they hired was an engineer. And they got him working on a fifth wheel hitch so that they could say adios to Charles Martin. And in uh, 1918, they came up with their own fifth wheel hitch design, which was basically like uh, the horseshoe uh, fifth wheel hitch that's still in use today. It was a manual hitch in 1918. They continued to perfect it, and they created the automatic fifth wheel hitch in 1926. So that if you look on any uh, the back of any semi tractor, you will see the uh, replica of the Fruhoff trailer fifth wheel hitch still in use today. The patent was given to the industry and standardized. So if you had a trucker, say in Chicago, who needed to go to California and pick up a load of oranges, and he would deliver them to say Denver, and then go and, you know, down to Nashville and get a load of pork and then bring it back to Chicago, he could drop off a trailer, pick up another trailer, drop it off, pick up another trailer. So it made, uh, it was really great for the industry. And I always kid, you know, tell that to our cell phone manufacturers. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we have like 50 different cords and gadgets, you know, depending on the cell phone. Right. But um, so that was really important. Um, I think they were constantly trying to grow the industry, constantly trying to improve roads. That was always in all of my father's documentation. There was lots and lots of correspondence with political officials um, with the you know goal of trying to improve roadways. Um, you know, keep in mind that 
even as late as post-World War II, roads west of St. Louis were unpaved. You know, you and I grew up with your state highway system. You know, you don't think about that. And also, the other thing we don't think about are bridges. You know, a bridge could maybe handle a passenger car, but not necessarily a semi-trailer loaded down with 20 tons. So not only did they have to improve roadways, but also bridges and, you know, other conveniences like that. Right. And heights of bridges so trucks get under them. I mean, you still see those on YouTube today, trucks going under passes that are too low and getting their tops of them scraped right off. But you think about all these integral pieces. And I know with Fruithoff trailers also, uh, your guys' trailers were the first to create a dump truck, a side dumper, and also a freezer box so you can haul ice cream around, right? That's right. That's right. In those days, the patents were held on refrigerated um, boxcars by the Pullman Company. Well, guess where the Pullman trains were being produced and made? In Detroit. And you can imagine in Detroit, it was like a little fraternity. I'm sure that they met these guys at the local bar and they were able to exchange enough information where my granddad was able to adapt an open wagon trailer into an enclosed wagon trailer and then a refrigerated wagon trailer. And they did this using salt and ice. It was done for really short hauls for one of the local Detroit creameries uh, for uh, hauling around ice cream. And, um, you know, they the trailers in those days were about 17 feet in length. And as they adapted and they expanded, you know, of course, they were able to lengthen them. And another fascinating thing I found about the engineers, they didn't go out and hire automotive engineers. They went after engineers who knew about skyscrapers or bridge construction. So if you have um, an engineer who really understands about creating a bridge, that's what they were doing with the semi-trailer. They were bridging the length between the front axle and the rear axle. So they yeah. needed the strength and the stability. And an engineer who knew about building bridges was able to bring that technology into the automotive age. This is so cool. I mean, really fun stuff. Well, let's Let's talk about what you're working on now that has you excited. I know the Fruoff Trailer Historical Society is uh, something that you've created. There's the singingwheels.com website um, and this book project. So uh, what has you excited these days about uncovering more about this history family of Fruoff Trailers? Uh, thank you, Mark. One of the documentaries that my dad created in for Eisenhower, he was one of Eisenhower's transportation advisors, was a, a funny documentary called Singing Wheels. Uh, you can find it on YouTube. It's it's a, kind of a riot, but beautifully done. And so I adopted that name for my website and also for the name of my book. Eisenhower, of course, one of his big pushes was to create the interstate highway system. And they used this documentary film to help persuade Congress that they needed to earmark money towards the completion of U.S. roadways and the interstate highway system. So I encourage you to check it out. It's kind of a cool documentary called Singing Wheels. We are working on book number three. I have my uh, second book, The Fruhoff Engineering Story, that's available on my website and also on Amazon. In addition to my first book, Singing Wheels and the History of the Fruhoff Trailer Company, we're working on book number three, which is Fruhoff, the first name in transportation, and we're editing it as we speak. And I'm also working with these international companies to try to unite them. The one thing about the Japanese company that is so unique, they took the early invention of the shipping container that was done by the Fruhoff Trailer Company in 1956. So they took that technology and really expanded it and perfected it. And they are really the leader in manufacturers of shipping containers in the Asian basin. And not many people know that Fruhoff was the inventor of the sem of the shipping container, excuse me. Malcolm McLean, who was a uh, one of the big customers for the Fruhoff trailer company, and many people know that name. He had a big shipping company out of New Jersey. We documented that at a, a trucking convention, he and my dad were chatting probably over a scotch in the bar. 
And Malcolm McLean was complaining about how the trailers were getting, were arriving at their delivery destinations, and they had been robbed by the longshoremen who would steal all the cases of whiskey. (laughs) So he was trying to figure out a solution to prevent this. And they were speculating, gosh, if we could come up with a, you know, a device that would be closed from point of origin to point of destination with no ability to open it in transit, it would accomplish the goal. So my dad got the Fruhoff engineers starting to work on this. The plant that was primarily used was the Avon on Lake plant in Ohio. And they figured out how to make a box without a a support structure underneath the chassis, if you will. And they had two different sizes, uh, 20 foot and 40 foot, I think. Although that's from memory, I might not be 100% correct. But once again, they gave the patent back to the industry so that the, the shipping containers would all be the same size. I mean, imagine if you had a ship and you were trying to load on different size containers, you know, it'd be like a Rubik's cube, you know, you'd have to try to figure it out. But standardized shipping containers, it would be relatively easy to load and offload that that ship. You know, it's all really fascinating because, again, things that we just look at and take for granted, these huge cargo ships loaded with these boxes and all the boxes are the same shape and how these boxes get unloaded with equipment that can unload all the same boxes and then put on the back of trucks and hauled We take for granted this commerce that we have. Things get to us so easily, so fast. And uh, it's fascinating that your family had so much of an integral part of developing all this with the systems. I I just find it really, really cool. Well, Ruth, up next is the last lap. Before we put the pedal to the metal, let's say thank you to today's Cars Yes sponsors. When you want proven performance, there's one brand that's been around since 1938. That's Edelbrock, building the finest American-made performance products for the street and track. Edelbrock's products are designed and dyno-proven to deliver maximum results. Edelbrock has thousands of made-in-the-USA performance products for all makes and models. From their new AVS2 carburetor and innovative ProFlow 4 EFI for your muscle car or truck. To superchargers for your daily driver and more, visit edelbrock.com to check out the latest products for your ride and when you're ready to check out enter cars yeah in the coupon code and get 10 percent off your order that's edelbrock automotive performance since 1938 you take care of your cars but who takes care of your investments tune-ups aren't just for engines updating your financial plan is important too your gps may take you from a to b but it won't help you on the road to financial freedom for that you need a good co-pilot and a very trusted advisor chris kimball cfp is just the man for the job he'll guide you down that road without driving you crazy For over 25 years, Chris has helped people just like you and me with their financial planning and investments. With a master's degree in financial services, he is eminently qualified, and he's a car guy too. Learn more at chrisvkimble.com or call 866-ON-A-PLAN. Securities through Money Concepts Capital Corp. Member FINRA SIPC. CK Financial Services is not affiliated with Money Concepts Capital Corp. Are you looking for a way to get your products or services into the ears of thousands of automotive enthusiasts around the globe? I can help. This is Mark Green here at Cars Yeah, and I'd be honored to be an influencer and ambassador for your brand in a unique and personal way. Five days a week, thousands of subscribers and listeners enjoy the Cars Yeah podcast and website. Contact me today and I'll show you how at mark at carsyeah.com or connect with me through the Cars Yeah website at carsyeah.com. All right, Ruth, we are back, and I'm going to ask you this, uh, a bit of an introspective question I ask all my guests here. If you came back tomorrow as a vehicle, now I'll say a vehicle, not a car, because maybe you're a trailer, what would Ruth be and why? (laughs) Well, my big love are those trailers that were done in the very late 40s, uh, steel trailers with the rounded nose. They, they were featured on the cover of the Saturday Evening Post and done in an um, illustration by Norman Rockwell, and they introduced the F-type van. It had an F on the peak and then eagle's wings 
that went around the side of the nose. And these trailers were absolutely beautiful. They were art, art deco in style, and they were really uh, just thing of beauty. And I was so sad when, of course, to provide cubic weight and volume, reduced cubic weight and volume for their customers, they made the square noses, which are the common trailers that we see today on use on the roadways. But, oh, my gosh, those those uh, rounded nose trailers were really, really beautiful, and I really loved them. You're the first trailer here on Cars, yeah, out of 1,426 people. So very unique indeed. I love that. Well, Ruth, up next, we're going to talk or jump into what I call the last lap. I'm going to fire off a series of questions and ask you to give our listeners some quick blips of the throttle. Since you're a trailer, you can't really do that, but uh, quick connections of the hitch or whatever we might say here uh, as we go through these questions. So here we go. What's the best, I usually ask automotive advice, but maybe transportation advice you've ever received? Well, I can't exactly answer that because one of the things that we did while we were piecing together the early history of the Fruhoff Trailer Company, during the bankruptcy, all of the documents were destroyed. So Mm -hmm. as historians, we were having to piece things together from people's memories or one of the things that we really used were the old advertisements. And those really were a breadcrumb trail that we could follow to help us, you know, when did they introduce the ProPAR axle or when did they uh, invent the I-beam axle? You know, the I-beam axle was the strongest um, axle in use, once again, adapted from skyscrapers, right? The I-beams that we see on, you know, building. But I created a Facebook group page and it quickly became populated by former employees, customers, enthusiasts from around the world. We have close to 3,000 members on that Facebook page. So whenever I was stumped, I would go to this page and say, hey, hey guys, I need some help here. Can you help me identify the year of this particular trailer? And right away, I had this amazing resource of knowledge and help and Oh, my, these guys are like incredibly smart and, and very generous with their time. Yeah. You know, it's pretty cool. I've Facebook in many ways can frustrate some of us, of course, but also it can be an incredibly useful tool. I can't tell you how many times I've reached out on Facebook, just did it last week where uh, somebody had contacted me about a taillight lens off an old, turns out to be a Ford Fairlane, I believe it was. And they couldn't figure out the year. I put it out there and literally within three minutes, I had the answer for them. Uh, it was just incredible. Same if you're traveling and you have a problem. I've been traveling and had a car problem. I go on Facebook. Hey, I'm in town. Anybody help me? And all of a sudden, somebody will pull up and go, what do you need? So uh, yeah, it's pretty fascinating. How about a personal habit of yours that you believe has contributed to your many successes over the years? Well, I guess I would have to say that I, I'm probably uh, stubborn, but the flip side of that is that I'm really determined. And I think it must, once again, be part of my German DNA that I, I just am so determined. I just, I don't let obstacles stop me. Uh, you know, you hit a wall, you make a left. In researching my father and my grandfather, I discovered that that was the kind of, those are the kind of habits that they too used. Uh, particularly my grandfather. I mean, they had the in the olden days with blacksmiths, they would live the living quarters were above the blacksmith shop. And because they had their forges going probably 24 hours a day, it was common risk of fire. And they had four total losses uh, in fire. And finally, my grandmother said, done. I'm done with this. We're having, we're building a brick <laughs> blacksmith shop <laughs> and and the fires stopped. But, you know, you can imagine how challenging that would be for them. But I guess it would just be perseverance. There you go. How about a resource? Is there one you'd like to share with our listeners? Well, I already talked about, you know, the amazing people that are on our Facebook group page. I would also say that the uh, seven remaining Fruhoff trailer companies around the world have also been incredibly supportive to what I'm doing with the history. And it's also really exciting to see how they've taken the old patents. There were about 2,000 patents that Fruhoff filed with the U.S. Patent Office. And of course, they have access to all of this um, intellectual property and how they've adapted these things for the 21st century. 
so both of those are amazing resources that we have taken uh, availed ourselves of. What is your Facebook page called so people can find it? It's called Fruhoff Trailers Were the Best. Trailers Were the Best. Okay, very cool. I'll make sure I put a link to that on your show notes page. Now, if you could sit down or if I could arrange for you to sit down and have a drink or a meal with anyone in the automotive industry, living or deceased, who would it be? I think I know. It would be my father. Of course it would. Yeah. No question about it. He was a dynamic guy, loved by many. He grew up working with the workers. He was very union friendly. And my grand, my uncle, who was a great deal older than my dad, they had a dispute. And I think one of the things that I discovered that was very different from them is that Uncle Harvey was very anti-union. And my dad was very union friendly. And I think it's because he grew up with the workers while he was hanging around the factory. And they were his buddies. You know, he wanted to make their life. I mean, his life was great. Why couldn't they all share? You know, there was enough to go around. But he was really loved by many. Me too. (laughs) I wish I could make that happen for you. That would be fantastic. Now, you mentioned the books. I want you to run through your books again real quick for me so I can make sure I put I list those. So let's start with the first one. Sure. Um, book number one is called Singing Wheels, August Fruhoff and the story, the history of the Fruhoff Trailer Company. That was adapted from the essay that I wrote for the German Institute and in their immigrant project. Um, book number two is the Fruhoff Engineering Story. And book number three, which is still in works, is called Fruhoff the first name in transportation. Awesome. I'll make sure to put links to those. When will the third one be available? Uh, Well, uh, we're hoping for early 2020. There you go. All right. Our books take a lot of time, so uh, I understand. Well, you can find all these great resources on the Ruth Show Notes page. I'll put links to them. Uh, You can go to the Cars website and just type Ruth Fruhoff, F-R-U-E-H-A-U-F, into the search bar. All right, Ruth. Here's a bit of a question for you. I'm going to buy you any cool collector car, or maybe in your case, it's going to be an old trailer. We'll see what you like, but I'm going to buy it for you today. What do you want? What can I buy for you? What can I park in your garage or your warehouse? (laughs) Well, Fruhoff got involved in the personal cargo trailer company uh, in about, I'd say, 1980. And I've always wanted to get one of those small little cargo trailers just to have in my driveway so I could say I own a Fruhoff trailer and not have to have a CDL license. So I think that would be what I would like to uh, find, uh, maybe on Craigslist or maybe one of your listeners can point me in the right direction. There you go. I think that'd be pretty fun. Oh, my gosh, Ruth, you've taken us on an incredible historic journey here. I think we could talk for days and days about this. I think it's fantastic that you're uncovering this history. You're pulling it out to share with everybody because like I said at the beginning of the show, when I was a kid going on the road trips with my family, you'd see the name Fruhoff. In fact, for years, like, what is that funky name? What does that mean? (laughs) It's the strangest name. Little did I know that way later in my life, I'd be talking to one of the family members about the history. And this has been so fascinating. I want to thank you for sharing this journey with us today. Could you offer us one little parting piece of wisdom or guidance before you drive off in your car with that beautiful Fruhoff? trailer behind you. Thank you so much, Mark. Uh, Well, I'd like to say that my grandfather was recently inducted into the Automotive Hall of Fame, which was also like an incredible, moving, emotional experience for me. And as I looked at the audience of beautiful people assembled at the induction ceremony, I wanted to tell them all, uh, you know, obviously the Automotive Hall of Fame is a historical endeavor and uh, organization, but tell your listeners, save your history. You know, the Fruhoff Trailer Company's history was all destroyed in 1997. And we had incredible challenges trying to piece together correspondence with branches. They had 18 branches around the country, not to mention the international branches. And it's you know, it's been a real loss that all of that history was destroyed and lost. So tell your listeners, keep your history, even if you don't think it's important or you're, you know, rolling your eyes, you've got to save all your documents. Maybe your granddaughter will want to write a book about you. Maybe so. I sure hope so. And again, what's the best way for people to follow along with what you're doing these days? I have a Twitter account and also an Instagram account, but probably the best way would be on my Facebook page. 
I have a Facebook page for the Fruhoff Trailer Historical Society, our group page, Fruhoff Trailers Were the Best, and then, of course, my website, singingwheels.com. And I'm about to launch a YouTube channel with some videos. That'll be really cool. All right. Great. Well, I would encourage our listeners to go check all this out. Fascinating history. I want to thank you for sharing an incredible story with us today. Ruth, until you and I talk again, I'll see you down the road. Thank you, Mark. You're welcome. Hey, Mark Green here from Cars Yeah. Did you know you can now see me on the Cars Yeah TV show? It's a weekly visit to some of my past Cars Yeah podcast guests, and I take you along for the ride. You go behind the garage door and into their lives, their businesses, and you get to see what makes them successful. With tens of millions of viewers, Cars Yeah TV is making its mark. Cars Yeah TV is available on MAV TV and Lucas Oil Racing TV. You'll find MAV TV on Direct TV. Fubo TV, Fios by Verizon, or you can stream it through Lucas Oil Racing Television online. And they said I only had a face for podcasting. Thank you so much for joining us on today's ride here at Cars Yeah. Drive on over to CarsYeah.com to find show notes and inspiring automotive fun. Download your free copy of Filler Up, a fun book filled with gorgeous photographs of fuel filler fun including quotes from more inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Download your copy today, and we'll see you next time on Cars Yeah!